Well, good morning and welcome to St. James. I am James Henry, the pastor here at St. James on the West End of Alexandria. It is great to see you in person and it is great to see those of you who are online joining us. For those of you who are looking at me and saying, who is that guy? He's not wearing his St. James shirt. Uh, every time that we have gone on mission to Appalachia Service Project, when we come back, we wear our uh, ASP Appalachia Service Project uh, mission team shirts. And so this is what it looks like from behind. This is what it looks like uh, in front. And so here we are back from that week. The last time we were able to wear our cool Appalachia Service Project t-shirts uh, in worship was 2019. Uh, that was the last time we sent a team from St. James to be a part of Appalachia Service Project. So last Sunday morning at this time, I was listening to worship in the car uh, on my way to Logan County, West Virginia, where we stayed in Mann High School. Uh, and they are the Billy Goats. So uh, it was... It was sleeping on the floor in a delightful classroom in Man, and uh, eating delicious food in the cafeteria and working from about 8.30, uh, 9 o'clock in the morning until about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, doing lots of work. On our team was Matthew, Mark, James, and John. Uh, we called that ourselves the Three Gospels and a Letter from the New Testament because we had all of the Gospels except for Luke. We were looking for a fill-in, but we could not find a single Luke anywhere we went. So unfortunately, they were stuck with James, uh, which happened to be me. We had a great time, we had a great staff, uh, and we met the most delightful uh, sisters who were living in a house that was built uh, by the coal company uh, in the 50s or 40s, uh, and so it was very exciting to see um, what could be done to make that house. Uh, when coal companies notoriously built their houses, they were not built to last. They didn't care so much about their employees as they did about just keeping them close by and having a control of their lives. Uh, intriguingly, when we worked on the bathroom, we we had four levels of subfloor before, uh, before you got below the floor. So, and normally there's just joists and subfloor, not four levels of subfloor. So it was very exciting, and we're glad to be back. It's good to be back with you. Uh, as we gather in the space this morning, what I'm hoping to do is talk a little bit about how important it is for us to be related and connected to one another and tie that into the time we spent, uh, the four of us on your behalf, uh, spent in Logan County, West Virginia, and the work that we did there, which was as much about building relationships as it was about the construction we did. We did finish our project um, as much as was possible for us. We kept waiting for the plumber. There was a contractor plumber that was gonna be there Tuesday, but didn't make it. Wednesday, but didn't make it. Thursday, but didn't make it. Friday, but didn't make it. So apparently uh, the contractor plumber did show up yesterday, which is good. You know, that's, uh, there are lots of important things going on in all these counties. So it was an honor to be a part of that. As we gather in this space and we talk about love, uh, I chose a video for us this morning by one of my favorite Franciscan theologians, Sister Ilia Delio, who uh, teaches right here in Washington, D.C., um, at Catholic University, um, and she teaches about love. That's her focal point. She is an expert on some of my favorite other people, and she and Richard are good friends, Richard Rohr, both Franciscans. So uh, I thought I would share this video about love, about re-envisioning love, and about understanding love as that connective tissue of all that is. So let's, um, let's deepen our worship experience with this video together. the end. It is
is love that matters. All else will pass away. We need a thoughtful love. A wisdom that sees and knows more deeply. A faith that trusts in the power of God who lives beneath our wings. Ours is the age of something radically new. It is more than a reformation. It is an evolution in love. It is not simply we humans who are in evolution, but God seeks to evolve, to become more being in love, more conscious, more God at the heart of the universe. This is the truth that sets us free, the light that eludes our sight. We are the privileged bearers of transcendence. God cannot do for us what we must do for ourselves, empty our lives of the inner clutter and noise so that we may welcome God within. Only when we allow God to be God for us can God save us, because divine love can do no other than make whole. God's love is unmanageable and unruly, it is creative, spontaneous, and novel. It slips in between our controlling urges and dwells in the unbearable wholeness of our being. What a cunning God this is, who hides in lepers and appears in a poor man carpenter turned preacher. Divine love is beyond what the human mind can imagine or invent. It is not logical or predictable. It has empowered life from the beginning and promises to stay forever because love is ever new, ever more whole, deepening the rich creativity of life's playfulness. We all have a part in this unfolding love. We are all holes within holes, persons within persons, religions within religions. We are one body and we seek one mind and heart, more personal and unified in love. This urging toward oneness is an invitation to evolve the divine. We must unfold the past into the quantum moment and let us aim toward the future. For up ahead is the Christ, rising from the dead in the darkness of night to become for us the God of the future. A reading for today comes from Prayers of Honoring Voice by Pixie Lighthorse called Honoring Practice. Thank you for this day of ritual devotion. Guide me to the mat, the trail, the teapot, the canvas, and the confrontation table today so I may test my flexibility and stay true to my form all the way to my edge. Be my mirror, my educator in matters of discipline and rhythm. Open the shelter of my mind to constructive, caring feedback. Let all that, become, that comes to me be my teachers. Move my form and feelings with dedicated habit. Help me rehearse for growing stronger and more resilient. Stand me up like a mountain. Spread my arms wide, expanding and clearing the valves of my heart to help me move from it. Point my fingers skyward and widen my stance, wrap enormous wings around my legs to strengthen my rooted position. Train me for the battle, which takes place within me in the form of fear and resistance. Help me create spaciousness inside of my container to make steady progress with my breath my invocations, and the attitudes that initiate my day. Lead air into my lungs, which comforts the grief held there. 
enhance my supportive routines with the golden light of your encouragement that shines through repetition. Let my body be a living ceremony. When I wander, bring me back to presence. Help me refocus without shame when I lose my way. Make me brave to notice where my balance falters and I compromise my integrity. Rededicate me when I discover what I'm holding and protecting. Get me back on conscious feet when I fall. Let my wingspan be the bridge between my spirit and my body. Ignite the fire of my willingness during times of challenge and overcoming obstacles. Put in front of me those who will help me persevere in my attempts to effectively resolve inner and outer conflict. Remind me of my tools for perceiving what prevents my flow. Help me be attentive to my part in maintaining the quality of relationship I am called to cultivate. Help me puzzle together my healing form with the help of Earth's electricity moving upward through the soles of my feet. Let me know I am not alone and that I never need to do it perfectly. It's a good thing James reminds me of things. We're going to take a moment and allow ourselves to center on God's presence, which is with us and was with us before worship with us now and will be with us after, always. But in order to feel that, we have to be present. So if you'll take a moment and breathe in and out. Breathe in. out, breathe in, and out, knowing that God has loved you forever, just for who you are, loves you now in this moment, and in each moment after this, and calls us to be present so that we might be present with this world. Here we are in the last week of July. Where did the year go? I remember growing up, I imagined that we came to worship on Sunday, that we came for me to children's ministry and to youth group uh, at that time in my life, that we came to Sunday school so that we could uh, pick up some measure of God, uh, some measure of Jesus, take it out into the world and pour it out, uh, take Jesus. You know, so often we talk about taking Jesus. We talk about um, carrying Jesus to the far-flung places. Uh, we talk about how uh, this is the place where we meet to talk about, think about, pray about, pray to God, and then we go into the world as if we have filled our cup so we can pour the cup out for somebody who doesn't have Jesus, uh, as if Jesus weren't there yet, that Jesus needed to be delivered by people like you and me who happen to hang out in very sacred and religious spaces, as if there are any more sacred spaces than out in the middle of life itself. Uh, I imagined that this was the place where I uh, when I became a pastor, that I doled out to you the riches of Jesus so you could take it out and dole it out to everyone else. And I can't tell you how 
very wrong I was to imagine God that way. That there could be any place that you and I would go that God isn't already. That there would be a need for me to carry to someone else Jesus as if they didn't already have Jesus with them. I think it's really interesting that one of the last things that's said in the Gospel of Mark uh, to the women about the resurrected Jesus is he's gone ahead of you to where you're going. Meet him there. For uh, those disciples who were from Galilee, it was to go back to the Galilee. Go back to Galilee, and when you get there, Jesus has gone ahead of you, and you'll meet him there. And it seems to me that when we send mission teams from St. James, as we did this last week, uh, uh, the four of us, Matthew, Mark, James, and John, uh, in Logan County, West Virginia, uh, attempting to make a difference for Virgie and Anita, two delightful women who welcomed us into their homes and lives and became a part of us for a week. Um, we uh, received as much of a connection from being with them as they ever received from being with us. Jesus tells us a little bit about that in a story that has come to be an enigma for the church. And the reason it's an enigma for the church is because we thought that you needed to go to religious places to get some religion, to get a taste of Jesus. And as if to turn us on our heads, Jesus tells this story in Matthew 25, because we need to be turned on our heads sometimes and ambushed where we least expect it. So I'm reading to you Matthew chapter 25, beginning with verse 30, uh, 32. At the appointed time, the promised one will come in glory, escorted by all the angels of heaven, and will sit upon the royal throne with all the nations assembled below. Then the promised one will separate them one from another as the shepherd divides sheep from the goats. The sheep will be placed on the right hand and the goats on the left. The ruler will say to those on the right, Come, you blessed of my Abba God. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me naked and you clothed me. I was ill and you comforted me in prison and you came to visit me. Then these just ones will ask, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you as a stranger and invite you in or clothe you in your nakedness? When did we see you ill or in prison and come to visit you? The ruler will answer them, the truth is, every time you did this for the least of my sisters or brothers, you did it for me. Then the ruler will say to those on the left, out of my sight, you accursed ones, into the everlasting fire, prepared, prepared for the fallen angels. I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you gave me no welcome, naked and you gave me no clothing. I was ill and in prison and you did not come to visit me. Then they will turn and ask, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or homeless or naked or ill or in prison and not take care of you? The answer will come. The truth is, as often as you neglected to do this to one of these, the least, you neglected to do it to me. This is the gospel of the Lord for this morning. Praise be to God. Well, Let's just be honest how very uncomfortable that passage is for most of us. Because we have developed a certain set of expectations about where we're going to meet God. This is a space. I mean, it's religious, isn't it? It's got some pretty cool little symbols. Really cool cross here, hand carved. Really cool table that was hand built for us and brought to us, given to us. Made from uh, poplar 
the, the branches of a large dead poplar, poplar tree and uh, the legs are made uh, of this uh, from the legs from uh, a Massachusetts uh, lathe in an old factory that was closed down. I mean, what better place to gather and share the table of the Lord than a table that was made for us and connects us to all those pieces and all these religious symbols and we have sacred space and we've, we've dimmed the room. If you were here in person, you would see that. And here we are saying sacred words, mentioning key players in the sacred story, people like Jesus, God, Holy Spirit. Now, if we say those things enough, certainly this is that kind of a sacred space. And if we're just expecting that it's going to take being religious enough to encounter God, Jesus has a whole other story for us. He tells us that where we'll meet God is in the least expected place, the place we are absolutely certain we won't meet Jesus. Because let's just be honest with each other. Let's just be honest with each other. Uh, we have our own preconceptions about those who are hungry or naked or struggling, um, the poor, uh, those who are, uh, in, uh, find themselves in a hard place, those who are strangers. Uh, the last thing we want to do is welcome them. We have a tough enough time welcoming the people we already know. Strangers, what will they bring to us? Will they bring change and uncertainty? Will they be different from us? Will they push our buttons? Will they push us to different ways of seeing things? And the answer is absolutely yes. And if we're just awake enough, we will catch a glimpse of Jesus. We will catch a glimpse of Jesus in the unexpected places. And that's what Jesus wants us to say and wants us to see in this story. We did not go to Logan County, West Virginia to bring Jesus because Virgie and Anita already had him. Those ladies welcomed us into their home. They made us part of their family. You know, one of the things that we usually take in fact, we had it with us when we go to a work site in Appalachia because the days are hot and the sun beats down and you need to be, have a place where you can get out of the sun. Um, in Appalachia, when we go to Appalachia Service Project, we take a tent. Ask me when we bought the tent and it came last week, uh, ask me how many times we had to set it up in Virgie and, and Anita's yard. Zero, because they welcomed us onto their porch. They sat on the front porch and they set up chairs for us at the other end of the porch so we could be spaced apart and safe with each other. And they welcomed us. Every morning when we arrived on the work site, they were on the front porch waiting to greet and welcome us. And tears were shed by both them and us when we left for the final time on Friday night because they had welcomed strangers from Northern Virginia. How, how much further from God can you get? They welcomed us and hoped against hope that we would bring them um, a sense of relationship and connection. They didn't need us nearly as much as we needed them to remind us daily that what's most important is our relationship to each other. The very fabric of all that we are is love. That's what really matters. That's what Jesus wanted us to know. We get so caught up in deciding where Jesus will be that we miss Jesus right in front of our face. We leave this building on a Sunday afternoon or back when we're back in the fall and perhaps we're having centering prayer in this space, we leave this space and imagine that the next time we come back will be when we have the opportunity to encounter and see God. But let me tell you, if, that's, if this is the only place you expect to encounter and see God, I have failed in my work. I have failed in my work. 
because you are so much more likely in the 167 other hours of your week to encounter God somewhere else. When you sit down to a meal with someone you love or even a stranger, when you see that stranger on the face and instead of looking at them in fear, you notice maybe the lines on their face and you say, there's a person with some wisdom who's experienced life and you appreciate them. And you imagine Jesus of the first century, someone who had been uh, blistered and, and burned by the sun, whose skin was probably not as soft as mine because his life was hard. The life of a carpenter living on the road, sleeping at the side of the road and in strange places. When you see the, the wisdom lines, that's what I like to call them, the wisdom lines at the corner of my eyes in someone else, you see someone who might offer you a glimpse of what Jesus looks like. Because for all the laughing and crying we did on Virgie and Anita's front porch, all the stories we told about a huge, the, uh, the Battle Creek flood of 1973, the, the, the holding pond that held all of this, uh, uh, the refuse from um, coal mining, broke open in a heavy rain and flooded the town and killed over 120 people, unsuspecting people in 1973, because the coal mine could, uh, the coal industry could care less about the people employed uh, near them. As long as they worked and there were enough to work, that's all they cared about. The home we were repairing, as I told you early in the welcome, was a home that was built by the coal company. And part of their building it was uh, so they could control the lives of the people who worked for them. It was part of a coal town. Back in those days, the coal companies paid their employees, not in real American dollars, but in scrip, which was company printed money. And it was only good in the company store. So you had to go to the company store to buy your food. And they created additional costs they charged more than the food was worth. They charged more than anything was worth at the store. So you always, always owed more to the store than you got paid by the coal company. And your only choice for buying was the coal store. I still remember a song when I was growing up sung by Tennessee Ernie Ford. You know, you load 16 tons of coal. What do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt. St. Peter, don't you call me because I can't go. I owe my soul to the company store. And it was into that that Virgie's and Anita's parents bought for $5,000 when the coal company no longer needed a coal house. Uh, for $5,000 bought this four room house and made it a home. Added the front porch because coal companies didn't put front porches on their houses. There were four rooms inside heated by a coal stove. That's all. Turned those rooms into a home and a bathroom and bedrooms and a kitchen and a living room where they've loved their family for years. Where Virgie and Anita's parents uh, lived and then when both parents died, uh, the two sisters moved back home and keep each other company on that front porch and in the living room and told us the stories of all of those things, welcomed us like we were family, and by midweek made us homemade spaghetti and garlic bread and mashed potatoes filled with butter for us to enjoy on the front porch with them. And on Thursday night, which is traditionally the picnic night, we brought a picnic dinner to them because in their isolation and concern for their own health, they couldn't go to the picnic that happens for the family. So we came to them and we sat 
for three hours or more together on their front porch, eating the burgers and chicken that we had brought and enjoying more stories and time together. Because you see, in the end, if you pay attention, if you're awake, you'll be surprised by the places you will meet Jesus in this world. And Jesus wanted us to know that. That's why I told this story. Where is in your mind the least likely place you'll meet somebody, uh, that you'll meet Jesus? Is it prison? Is it the hospital? Because those are places we're called to visit. And when we do, we meet Jesus in those places, in the vulnerable and the broken and the ill. Is it that we expect not to meet Jesus in those who are hungry or naked, homeless? Is it that we don't expect to meet Jesus in those places? Because that's exactly where Jesus said we would. We need the relationship that we provide each other. You listen to this story and you think it's about charity. As long as I give some stuff to the poor, a little bit of time to those who are sick or imprisoned, then I got two thumbs up with God. But in the end, you don't catch a glimpse of Jesus unless you let the relationship happen. It's not about me having something you don't have to give. It's about you having something I don't have and me having something you don't have. And in the exchange, we see Jesus in each other. In the best possible moments when we share the love of God, there is God right there. That's what happened for me. And I'm absolutely certain by the conversations I had with John and Matthew and Mark and all the other volunteers at the center that they too met Jesus there. It wasn't so much that they brought Jesus, although Jesus goes everywhere with us. The eternal Christ is everywhere. It wasn't so much that they brought him, although they did. It was that they met him. You see, for first century uh, folks who would have heard this story, this gospel, the Gospel of Matthew, uh, uh, seems to have been written for a Jewish community uh, about their possible faith in Jesus, in Christ. In that first century, if you were poor, it was because you must have been bad. And so God is punishing you by not having stuff. If you were sick, it must have been because you sinned or maybe your parents sinned and God didn't grant you health because you weren't good enough. If you were in prison, certainly you weren't good enough to meet Jesus. How would you ever meet Jesus in prison among people who have done wrong things and been put in jail or in prison? How would you meet God in those places? You wouldn't. You would only meet, it among, meet God among the religious. And Jesus said, ho, 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 watch out. It's a good chance you won't meet Jesus, God, among religious people because they're so busy thinking they already know me, they don't see me wherever I am. we got to get over our assumptions about God. And that's what Jesus tells us to do in this story. When you meet the person who's unlike you, what is it about them that reflects God's goodness, that reminds you of who God is, that helps you discover in yourself what is good about you? Because every one of you is infinitely precious and unconditionally loved for the person you already are and were made to be. And so is everyone else you meet. So look. Wherever you go, be there when you meet the stranger so that you can make room in your heart for them because in those moments you might see God. You might see God. For when we do it to the least of these, in the place we least expect to find God, we may discover God was there all along. We may discover it. 
So my challenge to you, and more importantly, my challenge to me, because I haven't arrived yet, even though I sometimes get a little bit puffed up that I have, my challenge to us is look for Jesus where you are, wherever you find yourself. And especially if you think this is not a place where Jesus would hang out. Chances are really good. He's hanging out there right now. And you might meet him. You might meet the eternal Christ revealed in places you least expect. When you do this to the least of these, your siblings, my siblings, you do it for God. You do it for God, and you see God there. It's time for us uh, to pray together. One of the, before we get to the prayer part, one of the pieces I was reminded that's uh, worth mentioning is over the years, we've done lots of different kinds of mission uh, that has opened our window and door to seeing God in lots of different places. And one of those, and we have a long-standing relationship now with Mr. Green, Mr. Green was someone that we helped through rebuilding together, and he's become kind of a part of our family. Ann and Nate still cut his grass. Um, Chris Richards still goes by to visit him at least once a month and make connections with him. And uh, so it's almost his birthday. And we uh, have a card out in the lobby. We encourage those of you who are in person Uh, Unfortunately, online, we haven't figured out a way to magically have you sign Mr. Green's birthday card, but you can in your mind, in your heart. But here, if you haven't signed Mr. Green's card, we invite you to do that. Also, uh, we are giving Mr. Green for his birthday giant gift cards. And so if you'd like to give a giant gift card, um, and by giant, I don't mean super big. I mean... Uh, the local grocery store giant uh, gift cards uh, to help with his grocery costs. And so that's one of the things we like to do for his birthday. So be mindful of that. Now we'll pray. Uh, I want us to pray for Virgie and Anita for what a gift they were to Matthew, Mark, James, and John this week and to the staff uh, who loved them. I want to thank you all I want us to give thanks to God that you all provided space for me to go away for this week uh, and for our team to go away this week to to make a difference there and to have our lives transformed by being there. Um, I want us to pray for the world in which we live. It feels to me sometimes like because the fabric of love is being torn by our divisions, it's hard to see love everywhere we go. The rhetoric of our politicians is that of fear and hate um, and mistrust, uh, and God would have us be something else. Uh, In the face of hate, in the face of difficulty, in the face of others who are different than us, we are called to do something other than what our natural instinct would be. Our call is to love, to love without reserve, uh, to love without holding back. That is the calling God has on our lives. So in a world that's broken, I want us to pray that we'll be courageous enough to love, to really, really love a world that needs love because Perhaps in and through us, others might seek God's love. Um, For the rest of Appalachia Service Project's summer, for the two counties, for the 20 counties we're in, I serve two counties as a a chaplain, Nicholas and Greenbrier, it's a blessing. But for all the counties we're in and for all the summer staff who are working so hard to make a difference in the world, all the volunteers from across the country that come there, Almost 8,000 volunteers coming to Appalachia, making relationships and being changed. I want us to pray for all of that and for the world in which we live. 
So we're going to begin in a moment of silent prayer. I'll pray out loud for us, and then we'll pray the Lord's Prayer together, a version of which will be on the screen behind me and on your screen at home. Uh, you may choose whatever version of the Lord's Prayer you'd like, or no version at all, to say with us at that point. Could we enter into a moment of silent prayer together? Oh God, you bless us in ways we cannot even imagine. And you meet us in places we don't expect to find you. You surprise us. And in the best possible meaning of the word, you ambush us. When we least expect it, there is love. Because love is all around. Thank you, God, for being you. For being unpredictable and unruly in your loving for not loving us only because we deserve or don't deserve to be loved, because it's not about deserving. It's just about loving. And you love us uh, both when we are deserving and when we might be undeserving, because love is a gift. Thank you for that gift. Thank you for making each of us to be who we are. And for all of your wonder and joy that you take in diversity. You love us to be different, not, not to be uniform or clones of each other, act or look exactly the same, but to be ourselves. To be ourselves on your behalf in this world. Help us to remember that not only are each of us infinitely precious and unconditionally loved as the gifts we are, but so is everyone else we meet. And that you are waiting to surprise us everywhere we go. We pray for the dividedness of our world. We pray that if there's a way for us to be a counter message, a message that is not fear, not distrust, but is instead love and trust, and courage, and it takes that. Help us to be courageously in love with you and the world that you love in our every moment. We pray for the ongoing Appalachia Service Project mission, uh, and as the summer program draws to a close in the next couple of weeks, we pray for all the staffers and all the homeowners and all the volunteers and all those who make it possible to happen the way that it has. Be in and through and around each and every one. Uh, those who are involved and those who have never even heard of Appalachia Service Project. And be with us especially as we seek to be courageously your people in a world that may not appreciate our message of love. Uh, that would prefer their own fear and distrust to love. Help us to be a different kind of people, a people who loves without limit, because we love as you love. We ask all of this in the precious and holy name of your son, Jesus, the very same Jesus who modeled for us a prayer that we pray now together. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. 
For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. One of the things that we do every week at St. James uh, is to share in communion. Uh, you are all invited to participate in communion, whether you're online or whether you're here in person. And as such, uh, if you're at home, obviously, we have not found a way to transmit communion to you physically. But if you're eating something and drinking something, you may hold those up when I lift those elements here and let them become for you your communion, your sense of connection. Here and in person, the way we'll do communion is uh, I will, uh, we will continue to serve for the moment um, simply the bread. You'll come forward, I'll give you a piece of bread. Uh, you may pull down your mask, eat the bread, close your mask, go back to your seat, uh, and, and receive communion as such. This is a moment for uh, you to reflect. How are you doing on meeting God everywhere you go? Are there people in whom you are absolutely certain God does not exist? Because that is probably where you are meant to encounter God. It may be very hard in some people in your mind and mine to see God, but you will not meet a single person God does not already love unconditionally uh, who is not infinitely precious to God. So are there those people? And how can you open your heart perhaps to see God in those places? Even knowing that opening your heart could be a risk that your heart might be broken. Uh, in the reception you get. That's hard work. So this is a moment to reflect on your own sense of love. During our communion, as we receive uh, and serve communion, we also receive our morning offering. If you're in person, you can put money or a check or whatever in, a pl in the plate. You can give, uh, you can text to give, you can give online, you can purchase things from our uh, wish list on Amazon for the West End Food Pantry, and those things often make their appearance right here on this table uh, as a part of our offering as we seek to reach out to our West End community and make sure folks are, are fed and not hungry. Um, you are invited, but you're also welcome not to come. If it's not in keeping with your faith, if at home you feel like communion only happens in a building when I've touched the bread, it's okay. It's perfectly okay for you to not commune wherever you are, if that's your choice. We don't want to push you away from God. We want to invite you closer. Because the truth is, you're already infinite, unexpectedly close. God is closer than your very breath. But we don't want to do anything that would alienate you. So join us for communion or don't. And know that in either case, you are unconditionally loved and infinitely precious. Either way. In the same night, Jesus was betrayed. He gathered with really close friends. Now, even really close friends abandon, deny, and betray you. Some of them stick with you through thick and thin, like Mary Magdalene. Keep vigil until the very end. But most of them are, uh, are likely to say something that hurts your feelings, that alienates you or in this case, abandon you when you're about to be crucified. And Jesus did not differentiate. Didn't say, hey, all of you don't count because you didn't, you're not gonna hang with me for the next 24 hours. Instead, he looked at those same people in love, in love. And he gave them a gift that they passed on to us, the gift of sharing in the Lord's table. And so while they were eating dinner, Jesus took bread from the table and he gave thanks for it. And he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, I want you to take and eat this. This is my body, it's broken for you. Do this as often as you will in remembrance of me. Also after supper, Jesus took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples and he said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant. It's shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So it is in remembrance of a God who loves you and everyone else that we come to this table asking that God would make this be for us. His body and blood that we would be for the world, the body of Christ, looking for Jesus in the unexpected places as well as the expected ones. 
I'm not saying you can't encounter Jesus here. You can. But you will encounter Jesus 167 other hours everywhere else. Uh, which is totally cool. We will be the body of Christ looking for Jesus everywhere we go and meeting Jesus in unexpected places. But even when we fail, because we're sure Jesus isn't there, even when we fail to recognize God's ambushing us in love, all of us redeemed by his blood, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Online, folks, feel free to take your communion whenever you're ready, whenever you wish. And here in person, once I have disconnected from my microphone, put on my mask, I will come down and serve you here in person. Uh, so the table is ready, and soon uh, we will be invited to it. lesson learned if you're doing the sending out uh, you may want to wait to chew your communion bread until after the service well I think one of the things that I love about the week at ASP is the connections that you make and you don't make them right away you know like when we first show up at um, Virgin Anita's porch the front porch, you know, we meet each other. You can tell right away they're just amazing people. But the connection develops over the course of the week as they're waiting for us each morning on the porch, as we get to know them. And you develop that connection. And you develop that connection as we work alongside each other. Matthew, before we, Matthew is our, our son, and he, uh, he told me that the main reason he was wanting to go to ASP was to spend time with me, which really meant a lot to me, and I felt the same way. And I loved the opportunity to do this work, and the heat, and it's hard, and it's frustrating, and Sam's, we, you know, you don't know what you're doing. 
And, uh, but the opportunity to build that relationship, build that connection with Matthew, with John, with James, during the course of the week, we become closer. And as I think about it, I think that is what, I think that's why God wants to be co-creator with us. That we're, we're, we're in co-creation of the world around us because God wants to make that connection with us, with you, with each one of us as we go through that journey together. And it doesn't just develop for an hour on Sunday. It is every day that I think we have to invite God to be with us on that, the full journey to make that connection, to be with us in the great times and in the tough times, that in that co-creation, we're building that connection because that's what God wants is the connection to you in your life. And so that is really my big takeaway from the week and from this message this morning that we need each other because we're built for connection. We're built for connection with each other and that God has built us to connect with him and to be with us as co-creators on this full journey. So as you go out this week, take that time to be in prayer with God on the front porch with God, to take that time to build that connection, to go to him with what is happening in your life, to invite God to be with you on the full journey, to ask God how you can be his hands and feet in this world around us. That, my friends, I think is um, a lot of what this is all about. So everyone, go in peace.